Hi, I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mujica. I'm a professor of chemistry at the School of Molecular Sciences. So we've been making a series of videos that look at different discussion questions out of Atkins, Physical Chemistry for the Life Sciences. And today we're going to look at uh, chapter two, which is about uh, the second law mainly, so entropy. And it's question three uh, at the end of this chapter. And um, specifically, this question is asking to suggest a procedure for measurement of the entropy of unfolding of a protein with differential scanning calorimetry. And I think the motivation behind this is when they're introducing the second law, which is really entropy, but really, you know, really getting into the fundamentals of heat. Calorimetry is the primary experimental method for measuring heat or uh, in thermodynamics. It's really, I would argue, calorimetry as a whole is the major way to directly measure thermodynamics in almost any system. Yeah. And differential scanning calorimetry tends to be one of the most uh, used methods, uh, modern methods for measuring um, you know, heat or, or most used calorimetric methods uh, to date. So I was really happy to see the book add this, and they even talk about it in some detail. And we have some separate videos uh, that go through some of the experiment, uh, experimental method and instrumentation behind uh, yeah. DSC. And, and I think <clears throat> it's uh, very important that you mention that, because if we think of the first law, du equal to work plus heat exchange. We realize that if we had a, if we could forget about this term always, then the energy would be exactly equal to work and we wouldn't need this strike here because if this guy is equal to zero, if heat exchange is zero, then the change of energy becomes a path independent as much as work because we don't have anything else. Right. But it's the presence of this term that makes the difference between mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, and thermodynamics. And it took about a uh, hundred years to realize that heat and work were two different ways of exchanging energy because this is not clear at all and right. it was not clear in the beginning so now we take it for granted but in the in the early days it was very hard to understand this type of connection because people came scientists and engineers they came from mechanics and in mechanics heat exchange is something that it's it's, it's not treated as in thermodynamics yeah well and, and it was very hard at the time when it was developed, right? Because they didn't have a molecular understanding no. of anything. No. So, you know, that had to be kind of a whole second, you know, after thermodynamics was developed and we just had this thing called heat that we, you know, we knew kind of how it operated, but nothing at the, it, it's not until Boltzmann uh, at all that, that we even started to get a grasp of what really heat meant at a molecular right. level. Uh, yeah, and, so and, and, and the other thing I was going to mention, precisely in the context of the differential scanning calorimeter, is that the source, the primary source of thermodynamic information is measuring heat capacities. Because heat capacities, heat capacity is precisely defined as how much, it's how much heat you need for a certain change in temperature. Yes. yes. So you, the system absorbs or releases heat so much the temperature changes. And, and, and this quantity turns out to be the main connection with the thermodynamic quantities like enthalpy and entropy and even energy. Yeah. So the heat capacity is the, the, the prime information we get about a system. That's why we get tables of heat capacity. And out of those, we get entropy changes, entropy changes, and now heat capacities we get from differential scanning calorimeter. Exactly, when like you said, like, you know, whether you define it as, you know, the limit as delta T goes to zero of, you know, the heat 
you know, over some, you know, change in temperature or whether you see it as kind of the partial of heat with respect to temperature, usually at some, you know, uh, it's almost always at some fixed value. I mean, defining heat capacity and, and measuring it, you know, this is what gives us direct relations to the energies we're used to. You know, we often, the reason we introduce enthalpy in chemistry is often, you know, to get its direct relation to heat under constant pressure conditions, you know, its relationship to, you know, entropy, et cetera. I mean, it really is at the heart of most of what we do in thermodynamics. Right, and, and you know, the, the fact that we have here entropy, because enthalpy is kind of simpler because it's an energy-related quantity. If we were talking about not entropy, but enthalpy. But you see, the way we compute the entropy change for a transformation is that you take a system from initial state to a final state, and let's say you do this in an irreversible way. If you want to compute the entropy change for this transformation, you have to bring it back reversibly to compute the entropy because the entropy is defined as dq reversible divided by t. So if you have an irreversible transformation, of course you can measure how much heat and everything, but yeah. you cannot calculate the entropy change of the system because yeah. you have to take it back. Now, to bring it back, and, the, and this is the beauty of, of this, you know, in, in, in a very famous textbook, now Lewis and Randall, yeah. Where yeah, some yeah, of the, one of the, of the classic, so. classic. You see, they have a, a, a piece of equipment that we actually does not exist. It's called an entropyometer. The entropyometer allows you to measure entropy changes. And now the entropyometer has two parts. It has a mechanical part and it has a thermal part. Because this is the other thing, be beautiful thing, that you cannot restore the system to the initial transformation just by doing work. In most cases, you need to exchange heat because there is no a simple path with zero heat exchange that takes you reversible. Right. And, and this is, this is the, 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 the oh, core right. of thermodynamics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and, and, and you know, speaking, so you know, we kind of split this up. I mean, it's, it's asking you to measure entropy and, and the importance of this, I, I think, can't go understated, right? I mean, like, the, you know, our, you know how you look at entropy, you know, its connection to the molecular world, Boltzmann, the information world, Shannon entropy, you know, how it, you know, connects, you know, everything is at the heart of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, but measuring it turns out to be very, very difficult, difficult because, yeah. I mean, because we have this definition, we can actually find a way to measure it. Yeah. It also, like you said, gets at the heart of why oftentimes we try to do equilibrium reversible type of experimental setups. Right. Uh, because otherwise we end up with an inequality where we can't say what the entropy is. Right. You know. And, and so. the other, probably the other important thing at this point is that when you, again, first law, oops, okay. That's, you know, the, the, the thing is that it, it, it depends, you know, under some conditions, the, the, the whole thermodynamics has to do with this idea. You can transfer all the work into heat. You can transform all the work into heat, yeah. but you cannot no. transform all the heat into work. Yeah. And this limitation is what entropy measures. Yes. It's, 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 it's the, the, the ability, you see, if you didn't have the, the heat term, any work that you do on the system or by the system is transformed into energy change. But if you have it, then thermodynamics puts a limit to how much work you can transform into heat and how much heat you yeah. can transform into and work. This is I mean, like, this was in the very early days, Carnot engines, how you go through, you know, isothermal versus adiabatic processes and what those efficiencies are. They made very practical uh, yeah. reasons too. How efficient can you build an engine, you know? Uh, and it Sterling, turns out that you know. efficiency cannot be yeah. equal to one, one. Yeah. except if one of the two sources has a, is at an infinite temperature. temperature. Yeah, exactly, Stirling type. So I, I, yeah, okay, I think we've, we've gotten that point across. Um, as far as why you would want to measure the entropy with respect to protein uh, unfolding or folding, folding or unfolding of proteins, 
uh, we have even other videos that, that go through this, but it, at the heart of biochemistry, you know, I think of you know, two or three major classes of materials in biochemistry, nucleic acid, genetics, uh, chemistry, you know, biopolymers, amino acids, in this case proteins, peptides, you know, uh, sugars, uh, saccharides, etc. I mean, but proteins are at the heart of biochemistry, at the heart of life. Um, and so to understand, you know, their structure and that they have these type of, you know, apparent phase transitions that sometimes are very irreversible and sometimes can be made to be somewhat folding, unfolding, reversible, mm -hmm is a very important to understand from the thermodynamic perspective. Right, and, 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 the, and the other, I mean, of course, it's, it's not exactly thermodynamics, but it turns out that many, many proteins or enzymes, they participate in catalytic processes in organic systems. Mm, yeah. Now, this idea, folding and unfolding, it's deeply related to how a protein inside a cell or an enzyme work as a catalyst because you have to, to distort the structure so much to, to transform into a, into a catalytic site. And then, but, but, in, but in, that, in that context, that transformation is reversible. Whereas if you take an egg, it doesn't look much like an egg, right? <laughs> and you put it in the, the Arizona sunlight, mm -hmm. then you get a fry, and this transformation is highly irreversible. <laughs> you can't come back. And it is very much related to, I mean, to, to this so-called phase transition related to protein folding and unfolding. The, yeah. the, the, well, the nature that is called the naturalization. Exactly, and, and I think that, I'm glad you even mentioned that. Like, here they're gonna call it folding and unfolding, but you, you see so many terminology used almost interchangeably in biochemistry, like denaturing, you know, a protein versus unfolding a protein, et cetera. And, and it, it, you know, a lot of times students will get lost in terminology. Uh, I know when I was learning biochemistry, it took me a while to wrap my head around all the different terminology they'll use to kind of almost describe the same thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the heart of, you know, understanding how the entropy you know, changes in this is, is critical. I mean, you almost have an intuition. If it's unfolding, it's going from, you know, a folded, ordered structure to an unfolded, disordered structure. So you have kind of a natural sense of what you think the entropy is going to do in this system. But, you know, you know, biochemistry can be a tricky beast at times when you really get to the heart of, of you know, what's going on with, you know, how also the solvent behaves around it and water orders around some of these things, et cetera. And, and you can often be really fooled into what your initial intuition is right. uh, and what actually and, happens. And, and, and this systems. is particularly true of uh, complex processes like uh, what DNA does when it is, read, you know, when, when, when you have in protein synthesis, you have to read. Yeah, yeah, DNA. ribosome. And, and, yeah. and then the ribosomes read it, but to read it, you have to unzip it. Yeah. And this sipping and sipping transformation has to be reversible, otherwise the cell will die. So we, it's better, it's, it, I mean, but it's reversible in a very particular sense. It's dynamically reversible because the ribosome, it goes over the structure, it reads and transcribes to RNA. This transcription process and the reading this has to be reversible at some level because once the, the DNA is read, it has to go back to what, what it was. Right. So it's, it's a very interesting example of what which you just said, that don't be fooled into thinking that unfolding is always accompanying the whole process of a, cha a positive change in entropy because that's not necessarily the case. Right. And I do think that oh, it brings up, like, you know, I, I think too often things get split up into kind of computational theoretical components or experimental, you know, and one having more importance over the other. I, I just find that to be futile. They're both so critical on each other, you know. To have a theory 
you know, is so critical so that you don't have to do every experiment so that after a while, once you measure a bunch of gases and you start coming up with something like the ideal gas law, it keeps you from having to do an experiment right. every time you want to, right. you know, so it, it, it's critical you, to you know, experimentalize. Jeff, I mean, you know that, but I'm a theoretician. I'm a theoretical physical chemist. So some arrogant statement about this interplay between theory and experiment will take some of my colleagues to say that the best possible experiment is a good theory. Because then you can prevent, you know, you having, having to do, 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 having to do anything. Having to of do course, the, the other view on this is that science is an experimental process yeah. to, to a large extent. I mean, the ver verification, you, could, you have a scientific statement and then you know, it goes, it goes all the way back to Francis Bacon to say that... If it doesn't base itself in reality, exactly, though, exactly. then uh, to me, I think that's a... I think both are futile arguments. One without yeah. the other, to me, it's is irrelevant. Particularly in, a, in science like chemistry. Chemistry is yeah. basically... Well, and I think science. we hit... Whether you call yourself a, a theoretical uh, or an experimental physical chemist, in a sense, both are so critical. You're, you're developing theories that... If they don't relate to the natural world, then no one cares, in a sense, to some right. degree. You know? And that to then a large extent... you might as well extent, just be a mathematician. That you know? <laughs> I was exactly going to say that. That's, to a large extent, the difference just between natural sciences, sciences and, and mathematics. mathematics. That's why mathematics is not a natural science. science. Yeah. It's scientific knowledge, to be sure. Exactly. But it's, it's, not, it's not a natural science in the sense that you just said. I mean, if I'm a mathematician... It's a large phase space. Only a I, very small if, part of it I, really relates if I, to if anything... I, if I am a mathematician, I can think of concepts and theorems and axioms. And they, they, they have their own logic right. and their own structure. But, but how the, that, you know, you know, but I, you know, even that, you know, how we understand logic, if it wasn't for mathematics, you know. Yes, only small parts of it relate to the real world, but very important. Yeah, and know. in some very beautiful cases and important cases historically, it turned out that without the right mathematics, they couldn't even put the physics together. So Einstein is probably one of the best but, known examples. I yes. mean, when he formulated relativity, general relativity for that, it was because there existed a particular geometry yeah that that Einstein could do what he did yeah exactly without certain transformation Laplace right right, right. transformations etc without knowing how symmetry you know there are so many examples you yeah. know uh, well almost every example in the natural sciences has its roots back in mathematics okay back to looking at why this last part is so important Differential scanning calorimetry, typically just called DSC. Uh, differential, meaning there's typically a reference pan and a sample pan. The reference pan has everything except what you care about, everything except the sample of interest. So it's going to measure a differential heat. So you need to contain it in something and have a whole bunch of other variables. It's to eliminate all those other variables except maybe your sample of interest. In this case, an enzyme protein, for example, we'll call lysozyme. You know, but it'll have the same water, it'll have the same buffer solution, it'll be in the same pan, it'll be held at the same temperatures and pressures, et cetera. So, and it's gonna measure a difference across that. Um, scanning, we're gonna scan across a range of temperatures um, at a certain rate. And calorimetry measuring, meaning we're gonna measure heat of some way. It's almost always, of course, temperature. We're measuring temperature. Um, differences here or, or changes. In, so this is gonna be some measure of heat flow um, you know, heat flow as a function of changing temperature, and we can decide the rate at which the temperature we change. Right, and you see immediately, I mean, you can make the correspondence between this plot and the, defi the definition of heat capacity. Yes, exactly. In fact, that is the main thing, is, is that by doing this carefully, you can change that y-axis. By right. knowing flow, right. meaning it's, it's rate dependent, which is not what we want right. in in reversible thermodynamics. So we're going to get rid of that rate by knowing at what rate we're changing temperatures to get it back to just heat, right? right. And just how the heat changes with temperature, which is the heat capacity. And this, again, about mathematics. You see, it is very important that students are able to go from a graphical representation of a concept or a function and the algebraic expression 
of that. So that you know that if, if you have a function f of x or you have the derivative f prime equal to df dx, right. that you can, uh, you can actually identify this in a, in a, in a plot. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important two-way well, avenue. And this one, this method of all others is so beautiful for doing this. When you get something, take the, the thing we would all think of starting with, you know, just we melt water. You know, this will be zero degrees, you know, so like, you know, it, you know, we can integrate under here to get, you know, delta H. Why? Because this is almost always done at constant pressure okay. so that the heat is going to be related to the enthalpy directly. And we can integrate that heat capacity, CP, you know, over a delta T to give us that, you know, and, and you can do those, you can do that numerical integration across there. The, the slope is, you know, the heat capacity, you know, of these things. So it's it's directly borne out in looking at these things, right. you know, directly. And, and so, uh, and, you know, it's again about concepts. You see, all of us, we have an intuitive way of understanding how we measure temperature. Just use a thermometer for that. Yeah. Now, it turns out that temperature is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a state function. Whereas if we if we try to measure heat, it this is not a state yeah. function. It's a, it, it's why we always have that when we exactly. do that that right there. I mean that is such a critical exactly, component. and and we write dt because this yeah. one, it's it's a state function and this one is not. So that, now you we use this in, in in colloquial language, in everyday language. We we use this in some sort of ex, you know, exchangeable interchangeable way, but they are not. They are very different. Measuring temperature and measuring heat exchange, these yes. are two different beasts. It is true that if you have two bodies at different temperatures, we know that we heat know is going to flow from the one higher... Direct which direction? Which direction. But that's not the same as measuring heat itself. You need the heat capacity of the of the bodies, and the heat capacity is exactly what you get from this type of uh, experiments. Yeah, and it, you know it's not exp but you know you is it possible to do differential scanning calorimetry under constant volume conditions? Could you somehow contain it within something that is non-expansion? You know seal it in some, yes, you know, it, it probably yeah. is. But as you can imagine, the, the experimental most common thing and the thing we're most used to is to, to put it in something that equilibrates with atmosphere. So, so you know, what, implicit in this is, in DSC, is almost always a constant pressure, constant pressure. you know, type condition. Yeah, because I, the other condition is much harder to... Yeah. to well, I, it's something... Uh, you know, and that's why, like you say, like we'll often just talk about the heat capacity and we'll forget, you know, the book will, will often rem will always remind you to put something like that at the bottom or, or this. You know, we often forget half the time we're almost always doing this molar as well. We, and we rarely put, you know, our symbols to remind ourselves that we almost always do it per mole and stuff. I, I always remind students that the same is true when we talk about you know, height. We rarely put the delta in front of a height of something, but it's never absolute. It's always from a relic from sea level to somewhere, you know, we should put a delta H, but we always, always just put H, right? It's the height of the mountain, uh, you know. And, and I, I use that as the example to say how oftentimes we get non-precise in our nomenclature, our mathematical nomenclature yeah. as well in thermodynamics. It, it causes yeah. a lot of confusion with Yeah, students. absolutely. And since we were talking about heat capacity, it is very important to distinguish between heat capacity and heat conductivity. Oh, because heat conductivity, the conduction, of, the conduction of heat, it's it's an entirely different thing. It tells you how fast heat can be transferred within a certain material, whereas the other one tells you how much heat you need to to input to, in the material to change the temperature. Yeah, to actually change and, the temperature. And, and these two things, you might think that they are really they are related. Right. But the the relation the relation between two is not trivial at all. It, at all. And and you can have some very you're right, those those can get confused right. quite a lot. Yeah. And it can lead to some huge misconceptions. And right. And that's why you know there are very practical examples. You go to the beach at the you know, well, North there's, Arizona. There's, there's, there's tons of things that have high right. you know, thermal conductivities that have very low heat capacity. Right. And then you, know, you are walking on the sand 
and the, 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 the outside temperature is, is the same, you might think. Yeah. Then you walk into sand, yeah, and you it feel it's very hot. <laughs> you, go, you get into the water and you say, oops. <laughs> so how come? Yeah. We, we thought that the whole temperature was the we, same. It was so, equilibrated. So, 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 That's so, how we treat everything. Exactly. So how come that sand has effectively a much higher temperature than water? Yeah. Because the heat the, capacity of water is very yeah, yeah. different from the heat capacity of sand. So to increase the temperature of water, you need to put way more heat Right. Then you need to put in sand. And, and, this is and why it's, it's, it's so one different. of the, you know, first things, you know, textbooks will often do is remind you that ice can have kind of a low heat capacity, but boy, does it jump up when it, you know, hits water and it jumps back down when it hits, you know, steam again. Like, you know, and, and one of the first things we learn about, you know, the exception that water often plays or its unusual aspects of having thermodynamics that can be significantly different than how a lot of other you know, materials behave. You know? Right, and, yeah, and an another beautiful example is the difference between a, a, a Turkish bath and a sauna. And a sauna? Right, yes. right, 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 right. Because then it's the density of liquid water in the internal atmosphere that makes the difference. In a sauna, which is the, 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 the Finnish bath, you can actually go at very high temperatures in there, close to, not 100, but let's say yeah, 80 yeah, very, Celsius. Yeah. But you can't you can. do that in a oh, no. bath because <laughs> then <laughs> that would be <laughs> like jumping on a bathtub. Yeah. And then you will discover what the difference in both heat capacity Properties. and heat conductivity <laughs> is. <laughs> quickly. Very quickly. Okay, well hopefully this discussion uh, uh, was, was useful for, you, for students in, in looking at this question kind of point by point here. And the book does an excellent job of, of going through some of the specifics of giving DSC. And I think it's critical uh, for students to, to you, you, data is abundant. You know, finding heat capacity data, finding differential scanning calorimetry data, and being able, as you mentioned earlier, to look at that data and use it in thermodynamics to make predictions, to figure out, you know, out of a whole list of proteins, which ones you expect to unfold or don't unfold, et cetera. You know, using thermodynamics is critical, you know, in this. Thank you. Thank you.